Well, a uh, pleasant good night to everyone. I, um, we are not so many in numbers because of the inclemency of the weather, and I understand there's a lot of traffic outside. But today is Friday. The Lord is here. You are here. And we have the minister here who will be ministering the word tonight. Put your hands together for Brother Glenn Roy. Thank you, Brother Tommy. Thank you, saints of God. Good night. Some heard, some didn't hear. Good night. It is a good night because Jesus is here. Amen? You must never forget that. He has said that where two or three are gathered. Not where people falling down and stumbling. That's not what you have to see. It's not because people are screaming and jumping. That is good also. But where they are gathered in his name, he's there. And his word is faithful. He, it cannot be broken. Amen? Amen? So Jesus is here. Hallelujah. Well, let's give him a lovely round of applause. Bless the name of the Lord. Father, we praise you and thank you. And we magnify you, Lord. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. And so, Lord, we know of your faithfulness. You are faithful to the end. Your word is true. You said, go into all the, way, the world, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So we have this confidence. And we thank you, Lord, for the presence of your spirit. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, both that indwells us, O oh God, and is in, it, is in our midst tonight in this service corporately. You are God of purpose, and Father, we look to you and we ask tonight, that you would be glorified, Lord, in all that is done and said. That, O oh God, you would minister to us by your spirit. Through your word, O oh God, faith will be built up in our hearts. And our lives will be changed to realize, Lord, all that you have gi given us. All that you have done for us and whom we are in you. Because of your wonderful grace. So let your will be done. Have the preeminence in this service. Anoint me, Lord, to do your will. And Holy Father, be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. I am tempted to say like my friend or our friend, Pastor Harry, get your pens, get your Bibles. You're going to be taking some notes today. I know the weather has been inclement outside, but that is outside. Amen? Amen. You have no inclemency of the Spirit inside. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So forget who's not here. Forget who, what has happened outside. We are in the presence of God. And if only for this moment, realize that we are in his presence and we thank him for serving us and for doing for us what he will. Amen? It is by faith that we receive it. It is by faith. It is not by what you see with your two eyes. It is by faith in him and in his word. We minister nothing else here. We preach nothing else here. We take a backstage and put the word of God forward. Amen? Amen. Is that okay? Amen. Right. That's what we're going to do tonight. And I think the Lord has sent a very wonderful word. Of course, his word is always wonderful. But it is interesting. It's going to be chock full with, with information. I hope not too hard for a Friday night. You know, we have had elections and we have had work and we have had all sorts of things. But yet the information that will come would help us. And it is intended to help us in our walk with Christ and in our life of prayer. Tonight we are going to be talking about discerning the ways of God. I, I know I ministered before on discerning God. This message is completely different. It's discerning the ways of God. And since we know, I mean, God is awesome and we can't know everything about him and talk about everything about him in one night, our focus will be in respect to his response to our prayer and receipt of the answers from him. So we want to discern God's ways, or we want to have a discussion tonight about discerning how God deals with us and answers with us in relation to our prayer and our approach to him, okay? Is that all right? Yes. I ask you because I don't want to preach nothing that you don't want me to preach. 
Now, to discern is to perceive or recognize something. And perceptions speak of intuition. It is not, you know, we are so fixated. Now, if you, have a, if you look at people in a waiting lounge, probably in, in the airport or some public area, about 75% will be looking down into their cell phones, their laptops, their, 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 their whatever, their MP3s, their whatever it is, their, 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 their tablet. We are looking at something, looking, we are seeing something, we are being informed by what we see, we are communicating by what we see. And we live in this, it is a very dynamic age. But we will never see God. And we are supposed to be communicating with him and, 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 and living for him and experiencing him in our lives. So I interject this at this point to make you realize how, how, how different it is from the way we live our daily lives to experiencing God. I know some people would like someone, I don't know where I'm going ahead, I just only dealt with my, my um, definition, but some people will like someone to make an app. <laughs> Download an app and you're in the presence of your Lord. <laughs> yeah? An app for smartphones, right? <laughs> and smart Christians. <laughs> you download the app and you're in the presence of your Lord. No set of praying and fasting. You can't eat and <laughs> you have to forgive. No, I think God should make this thing easier. I say that at the outset so we would realize that how we are accustomed it's different from how God, we ought to relate to God. And we see it through the message. Amen? Amen. Yeah, so uh, to, to, to discern is to, is to hear, to see, to notice something with difficulty and with effort. Normally, a, a discern is like this. You see in a set of things, but what is really the truth is what you made out from all that you have seen. I could have given an analogy that is current to this week, but I won't go there. My brother Kenneth is laughing. I don't know what he's laughing at. Isaiah, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Passages of scripture that we know, but I'd like you to turn to. Remember I told you, get your paper and get your pencil. So we have a little bit of Harry notes coming for us. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. It's the chapter that starts with whole everyone that thirsted come Isaiah 55 but I want to read the chapter I would like you to read the chapter when you go home it is a beautiful it is a beautiful prophecy and a wonderful chapter in the word of God Isaiah 55 we are in verses 8 and 9 and it says for my thoughts are not your thoughts Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Have you seen that? Is that in your Bible? It's important for you to get this. Don't miss this one because we're talking about discerning the ways of God. And we are talking about discerning the ways of someone that is far different from our ways. His thoughts are far different above our thoughts. So we are talking about, but, but again, could I really discern the ways of God? That's why I use the, 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 the term discerning and not even the term knowing the ways of God. Because sometimes we think we know what God would have done yesterday and as we say, we don't put him in a box. So we don't know that he will do that today. All, he, all we know is that he will do because he's supreme, he's sovereign, Amen. So that's why we have the term discerning it. Verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, it is interesting that God said this immediately after. He could have left it there. My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. But out of an abundance of caution, and to make it absolutely clear, he's telling us in the next verse, you see how far the heavens are? 
that so far, my ways and my thoughts are from you. You see how far the east is from the west? That is how far. Let me put it in my way how I understand what God is saying. You see how you understand it to be done? That's not what I am going to do. Is, is that what you get? Come on, help me. I mean, because you, it's important that we get this teaching. You get that? From, from, from the verse? The way you expect it, it's not the way I will do it. That's what we are talking about tonight, and let us develop it. But hear these few notes that the Lord dropped in my spirit that will give a purpose for the message, a background to the message, and to show you that God is speaking to your particular need tonight. We, are often, we often receive instructions and exhortations in righteousness, in spirituality, and Christian living. That's what we do when we come to church. We get instructions, we get exhortation in righteousness and in spirituality and in Christian living. That, that, that's what our, our, our church is all about and our faith is all about. That's what we do when we sit here after worshiping the Lord. We receive instruction, receive guidance. These teachings are not about forms, not about practices, not about procedures, nor are they about do's and don'ts only. They are, they are not only about the promises, the benefits, and the rewards. What we will call, they are not only religious ordinances. The, the, the word of God that is ministered to us from time to time is not only the word telling us what to do and not, what not to do. How to get and how not to get. The word is it includes that, but it's more encompassing. Follow me. The word that is ministered to us is history, in part. Prophecies, in part. It is testimonies and examples of faith that cover every human situation that we may encounter or can encounter. But most importantly, the word that we receive, the instruction, etc., contain revelation, knowledge about Jesus Christ and God the Father. Knowledge such as the nature and character of God, the names of God, the ways of God, the majesty, the power, the glory about God or of God. And they are essential for our understanding and our relationship with God. So not only do we get instruction in righteousness, yes, but we preach a lot and we hear a lot about who God is. Our message last Friday is, uh, he changed not. I am the Lord, I change not. It is, and these things are important for our faith. Hold on, you'll understand where I'm going. You see, if a message like that was not in the word of God and not ministered to you, you and I will have occasion when we really face trouble to believe that maybe this is not going to work. You understand where I'm coming from? If you do not learn or hear or it is not preached to you about who God is so that you will understand when things get tough and hard, then you will have occasion to say, well, I really don't know if I'm doing the right thing. But because we know about the nature and character of God, because we know about his glory, his power, his majesty, because we know about his ways, and we're going to be talking about tonight, a part of it, in part, that gives us understanding that though we may see certain things a particular way, that's not how it is. That's what God has in his word. And I am ministering this by the Spirit of God tonight so that we will understand, saints, our faith must stand in God, not in externalities. Jesus Christ said that the kingdom of God is within us. Come and say that after me with me. The kingdom of God is 
The kingdom of God is? So we need not spend too much time looking to see what is happening externally to really make us know that we are in the grace of God. It's not the external. It is the internal. That is why Paul said, examine yourselves. Examine your own self. Don't you know that you are in the faith except you are reprobate? So let us do that tonight. Examine your own self. Those of us who have doubts, and I'm sure many of us have doubts at many things, many times. But do you have doubt about this, that you are a child of God? I have answered it for me. I have no doubt, and it is not a boast. What about you? Examine yourself. Now, all this instruction is contained in the word of God and is aptly summed up in the following text. And I'll just quote it for you and you write it down. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. We know that, but I'm repeating it here as the foundation for our discussion. And it's profitable for righteousness, for instruction, until the man of God be thoroughly grounded unto every good works. I'll quote it wrong. Let me go to it. Second Timothy 3. I knew the script here. It's the script here I quote all the time, but I'm preaching and looking at your face and I forget everything I know. <laughs> Not going to look at you guys. <laughs> Turn around and preach. Second Timothy 3.16. All script is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. The purpose of the scripture is so that you will be furnished thoroughly. Someone say thoroughly. thoroughly. Hallelujah. So much scripture is coming, and it is coming with you in mind so that you will be furnished. Romans 15 4. Let's run quickly to it, mark it down. I'm not going to try to quote it. I'm still looking at you guys. So no. Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Whatsoever things written aforetime were written for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. Because it was written before, it will help us to learn. And by patiently going through the scriptures, we are going to have comfort. And we are going to continue to have hope in God. Amen? This is the reason. And remember, I'm ministering this message, discerning the ways of God in relation to our praying and to, to God and receiving answers from God. Amen? Amen. Keep that focus. Keep, because on, why I'm, I have had that focus is because on a Friday night, it is a time appointed in this ministry when we would pray and minister to your needs. Be they spiritual, be they physical, it's healing, whatever your need, your prayer needs are, that's what we deal with. And it's very important because when we come to pray, if we do not come rightly, we end up praying amiss. If we do not come focused, we pray wrong. Amen? So we, try, we are going by the word of God to clarify how we understand the ways of God. And Ephesians 3.20 that says, mark it down, these three texts sum up everything I said before. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, sorry, exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. So those three scriptures are three pillars for tonight's message, including what we have read from Isaiah, but of course that's a text. With deception abounding more and more in the world, including self-deception, many of us deceive ourselves. Many Christians deceive themselves. There is a growing sense of doubt and uncertainty because of deception. We are not doing the right thing, or we think we're doing the right thing. And we fail because we are not doing the right thing. And there's a growing uh, a tide, a growing sense of doubt and uncertainty when it comes to our faith in God and answers to our prayer, of our prayers to God. As I said, Many times, there are many of us who, in error, feel that Christianity should be a perpetual 
a life of perpetual excitement and constant miracle experiences. Don't you feel that sometimes? Yeah. That since we serve in this big dynamic God, when you walk in, <laughs> when, you, when you do, it's supposed to happen in a, in a instant, like um, what, what, instant? What's in my instant? Give me an example of instant. Hmm? Everything must happen. If this thing is right and if it's spiritual and true, it should happen like that. Don't you feel so sometimes? Yeah, because it's God. It's God you're talking about. You know what <laughs> right? and, and we feel erroneously that it, there should be constant excitement, perpetual excitement, miracles left, right, and center. And yes, yes, I'm going to that church. Yeah, I'm going to that church. Yes, have miracles. Remember, I want your feet to stand in the word of God. No. Now, it's not that we doubt God or we doubt that God exists. None of us doubt that God exists. Or that he is almighty. That Jesus Christ is Lord and he answers prayer. No, we don't doubt that. Anybody doubt that, that God exists? Anyone doubt that God is almighty? Anyone doubt that Jesus Christ answers prayer? God answers prayer? No, we don't doubt that. I ain't getting no hands. And I'm getting some innocent faces. Yeah. Some of the doubt you, but I ain't gonna pop man. <laughs> so it's not that we doubt that, but we are doubtful, hear this, and we are not confident that God will answer our particular prayer. Somebody say, Our particular prayer. Say, My particular prayer. That is the one. I know God big and thing and he make moon and star and thing, but I want him to answer this. Am I confident that he will do it? That's what I'm saying in the message. And this is what the message is intended to help us address. We hear the word of God, which says that God is able to do what we ask. But oftentimes, because of our experience, because of the size of our problem, we openly doubt. Or as we say in Trinidad, we receive the word of God with more than the proverbial pinch of salt. We hear, as our pastor always say, we magnify our problem before God, more than God. This thing bigger than God. We have a tendency to do that. So as a result, when we have to ask God, you know, how God doing that? Pastor preach it many times. It's what we do. Will God do this one for me? Why not? Why would he not? Did he tell you which one to ask him about? Did he tell you bring the, bring the medium-sized ones? <laughs> bring the small ones? But the big ones, leave them outside the gate. I'll send Gabriel and sometime when, when I'm ready. No, he said cast all. Am I correct? Am I... Am I Am I preaching apostasy? God wants you to cast all on him. Now, which problem you have that he cannot handle? Now you will say, Brother Glenroy, I believe. I believe he can handle it. So what I'm saying here, that is not what your problem is. It's not that you believe he cannot handle it. You don't believe he will handle it. I'm getting more pointed now to your prayer. Lord, I know you could do it. You do it for pastor. You do it for brother Kenneth. I, you do it for Elijah and them, Lord. But me. In circumstances where we believe, that is, whenever we believe, because there is delay, we pray and the answer didn't come, we conclude that God did not hear us, one. And you know what we do? We abandon our hope. We withdraw our prayer. That is, we cease praying and cease believing altogether. Why? There was a delay. There was a delay. I asked God, and it didn't happen yet. So I'm not asking him again. <laughs> yeah, I ain't asking him again. I asked him already, right? He, I didn't, he didn't answer me. 
And we have ministered to us many times. The woman who went to Jesus Christ, the Greek woman, a Syrophoenician, saying, Lord, would you heal my daughter, please? She, she is possessed with the devil. This woman, Jesus, never answered the woman. <laughs> is that in your Bible? I have many other stories to go to. I don't want to go to that one. I tell you, I have plenty of notes. Jesus didn't answer. So half of the Trinidadian Christians in the crowd gone back home. <laughs> because he ain't answering nobody. Next one will say, well, boy, we asked him already. And he ain't saying nothing, so we're going there. You're going to make yourself a fool? And we go on. Come on, I'm talking about us. I'm talking about our prayer. This woman had a request for Jesus. And his, 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 his ignoring her was so obvious that the disciples came and said, well, Lord, send you away because she, 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 she bought in us. I mean, if you're not going to answer her, if you're not going to answer, at least stop her from coming behind us, asking us. Now, Jesus was teaching an object lesson. But of course, remember, we do not know the ways of God. So, Jesus did not talk to the woman. He, 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 he was teaching them a lesson. But he spoke and make sure he spoke in her earshot. <laughs> he said, it is not meat. It's not right for me to take the children's bread. It's Peter he's talking to. And throw it to dogs. The woman heard that. Being a Trinidadian, whoa, well, whoa, well, well, listen, we gone. <laughs> we leave Jesus long time. We go make out how we could. I'll fix up a daughter or get somebody to help you out. <laughs> no, that's what we are. But this woman, when she heard it, because she had need of him, she said, Lord, that's true. But the dogs just get some crumbs. <laughs> that moved Jesus. Man, that moved Jesus. Great is your feet. She was not put off by what happened at first or the first response or the first set of results to her prayer. Now, it was a story of something that happened and it was mentioned in the word of God for our learning. That's why I read the scriptures. Now, you will say, yeah, uh, Brother Daniel, but that happened all in about the space of 15 minutes, about two years now of praying. You know, yeah, I know. I, I know your thoughts. <laughs> Holy Spirit dropping them in, me, in my mind. So you say, well, yeah, but mine longer than hers. But the word of God teaches the principle. If, if I, I do not know, Jesus' ministry on the earth was about three, uh, three and a half years. I didn't know if he could uh, keep her waiting for, for three and a half years to come back to, uh, the issue. But when we doubt God, unfortunately, we look at every reason, argument against the word of God. And the other scripture I did not read, but I, of course I, I didn't tend to mention it, is that Jesus said we must receive the word as a little child. Or else we will not enter into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. We will never get to that position if we do not receive it as a little child. How does a little child do something? Let's play my grandchildren last night. One pushed down the other one. The other one started to cry. And in two, I just put my hand and said, don't cry, sweetie, in two minutes. And in two minutes, hardly so much, boy, but I think 30 seconds, they're going back playing. <laughs> you and I, if something happened, well, boy, past times I've seen us passing Baden, Baden Powell Street. If, if the pastor want to see us, you got to hang out somewhere on, on, on Rising Road. We're staying far. Come on, that's how we are. Because we have not received the word as little children. We have issues. Issues based on our experience. And sometimes rightly so. But that is the reason why we need more prayer. And we need much prayer. Because we do have issues. So why don't we not pray often? 
Yes, we have issues. That's why Jesus said that such goeth not out except by prayer and fasting. It would require much prayer, much submission to God, much humility in the sight of God, much waiting on God to break some of the issues in our soul, the issues that have found its way in there because of our experience, because of hurts, because of evil, because of our nature. So we want to come as Christians, stand up, receive, ask and receive it like a lightning and then walk outside and be the same way. So this is why the word is coming to us, so we will discern the ways of God. All right. Tonight, we want to be reminded again of the ways of God. And we want to look to the scriptures to show that God's response and methods usually differ from our expectation. I want to repeat that. God's response and his methods, not his answer, his methods usually differ from our expectations. The first, the, ne the first scripture or next scripture I want to refer to, I won't go to it. It's Elijah in 1 Kings 19.12. Mark it down. When you get home, you do a little reading. Okay? Election over. Right? <laughs> well, you're not living in St. Joseph. We... <laughs> Peace. What scripture did I give you? Right, let me give you the, the story behind it. That was just, that's the prophet Elijah. One of the greatest prophets. The man who walked so well with God. And he never tasted death. He was taken up in a chariot of fire. This was the prophet Elijah. After he slew the 400 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And Jezebel sent word to him that tomorrow, by this time, you're dead. He run, hid in a cave. And this is the incident of the cave. When God tell him, well, okay, you go and stand on the mountain. And I will pass before you and proclaim the name of the Lord. And when the Lord passed before him, there was hmm, strong wind. It rent the rock. It break up in pieces. God was not in that wind. Remember, he is looking out for God. But what was miraculous? Okay, let me, let me finish with the story. Then after, there was an earthquake. It shake, everything shake. Elijah was quick. But God was not in the earthquake. And after that, he started to see one set of fire. Well, we know God is a consuming fire, right? But God was not in the fire. After that, there was a still, small voice. And God was the voice. If you analyze that story, you see the spectacular? You see the preacher who sweat and had a chain shirt? <laughs> you see all the machinations of men? God may not be in it. I'm not telling you God is not. God may not be there at all. You see, they're among the people that, 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 that crowd into the congregation and all receiving the glass of miracle water. <laughs> and you can't get seat. No, no, I'm, I'm serious. You see all of these things grand. I'm not saying God is not in it. I'm saying God may not be in it. Here was the prophet Elijah. Waiting to see God on God's instruction. Stand up and have to contend with an earthquake, a strong wind, and a fire. And he saw God in none of them. And God was in the still small voice. And you know what is interesting about that story when you read it? When he heard the voice, he said, speak, Lord. And he went out and met him. My sheep know my voice. Say that after me. My sheep. Know my voice. But the... My time flies, boy. Somebody put strong batteries in that clock. All you put... All you do yourself. 
The story I really like and want to share is a story in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. And I won't read the story. I would have to tell you the story. If you do not know it, this is a beautiful story in the word of God. I mean, I just always say sometimes when I, many times I'm preaching, when I come up with a script here, I say this is my most favorite one. <laughs> Uh, truly, the word of God is beautiful. It is wisdom. It is strength. It gives you understanding, like I mean, like man, like nothing before. What did I say? Second Corinthians, nine, Second Chronicles, sixteen, Second Chronicles sixteen. But this story is interesting. Sometimes, as a preacher of the word of God, I try to resist speaking about it because many times. Many people do not read the word and do not get into the Old Testament. At times they don't get the gist of the stories and they don't really believe in all that is said. But here in the 16th chapter, let me read it. In the 6th in the sixth and 13th year, I'm in the 16th chapter of Second Chronicles, it starts with in the 6th and 13 years of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah. I'm reading from the King James Version. If you're in another version, you might find it a little different. And he built Ramah to the intent that none might go in or come out from, uh, of King Asa from Judah. What is that verse saying? In those days, cities used to be built and walled around with one main gate to enter and so on, etc., etc. Et the kingdom of of, of, of Israel. God's people were divided. Judah to the north and Israel to the south. Israel to the north, Judah to the south. And they were fighting against each other. God's people. Oh yes. God's people just fight against each other. My God. And Basha, which was king of Israel, decided he will do for Asa. So he went and built a city right on the entrance to the city of Asa. So Asa would not be able to come in or go out except he either paid tribute to Basha or some sort of thing. That is what this story was about. Let's read verse 2. Then Asa brought out the silver and the gold out of the treasure of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee, as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go break thy league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. And Ben-Hadad hearkened unto the king Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they smote and they smote Ijon and Dan and Abilim and the store cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Basha heard it that he left off building Ramah and the, and the work ceased. And Asher the king took all Judah and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof and they built two other cities, Geba and Mitzpah. And at that time, verse 7, and at that time Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Asia and said unto him, because thou relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thy hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet thou didst rely on the Lord and he delivered them into thine hand. This is the verse I wanted to come to and this is the text that I want to minister from. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show themselves strong in the behalf of them, to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose hearts are perfect towards him. This is an interesting story, and I want to bring it into the discussion here on understanding the ways of God. Because this is also an error that we make when we are seeking God. If you look at the story, we realize that Asa was in trouble. And many times we are in trouble. But in this instance, Asa had some resources. Albeit it was the gold and silver that they were using in the temple, in the house of worship. 
You know the man took out the gold and thing and sent it to Syria. Well, you know what happened in Syria now. <laughs> sent it to the king of Syria and say, okay, break your league with Asher. Look, gold and silver. In other words, he paid him to, to come and fight against, against Basha. And so, Basha had to leave because what he did, Basha, while Basha was building here, he ended up beating all the cities around. And Basha heard of that. His heart broke. He couldn't continue here because his cities are being destroyed. Why build one <laughs> and one others being destroyed? So that was a strategy of the enemy. But look at verse 7. Now, Asa got himself out of trouble. But he got himself out of trouble by his own hands, by his device, not by relying on God. And we know about that. We know about it. It happened with, Israel, with um, Abraham. And today we have a tribe that is against Christians. God promised Abraham a son. We knew it. We, we know the story. But the story is that. And because Abraham was old and because Sarah was old, Sarah thought that she would help out God, encouraged Abraham, her husband, to go with the maid and make a son. Probably it was the acceptable practice in those days. It was a long time ago. I was in the wrong. So, God promised you a son? Here, there's your son. We know about surrogacy and so on, where we could get people to make, make baby, and you take, it, you take the sperm and put it in the next woman, and she just carry the baby, you give her some money, you know, son, and you have your son. All sorts of things. It, it is one of those devices, one of those strategies that we can use to get through without relying on God. And the story of Israel, of, of, of Ishmael and Isaac and Ishmael, we know it. We don't have time to go into it. And this story here is another classic case. Classic, classic, classic. This man, the, he had some bread. He had some savings. He had some funds. He had some gold. So he could have relied on his gold to bring him the victory. But look at what Hanani, look what Hanani the prophet said to him. He said to him, were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host? In other words, hadn't God given you victory in the past against multitudes? Why didn't you rely on God? Why did you have to pay? And look what he took, the gold from the temple. You see the extent to which he was prepared to destroy or desiccate the house of worship to get his own victory in his own mind, in his carnal state. He was fearful. He was in too much trouble. And many times it happens to us as Christians. This problem, this letter that I get here, this one too big, I can't sleep. Saints of God, I'm not able to go in tonight, but I have gotten many, many letters. I, sh I got some letters and I show it to my wife. And, and, and my wife asked me, how are you paying that? I said, well, sweetheart, God knows. And how did I pay it? God knows. Yes. And there are times that things would come up. And, and I mean, I, I mentioned it there quite easily, but it was, it was serious issues. Issues to really, really, really take your peace, take away your trouble. But God did not want you to rely on anything else. You put your trust in him. Don't put your trust in what you see, in how you perceive it to be. Put your trust in God and let us understand his ways. So in understanding the ways of God as it pertains to the, letter, the, the message now, discerning the way of God, is that God looks for those of us whose hearts are perfect towards him. Not you are perfect in all your ways. My heart is fixed on God. My determination is God is going to help me. I have always ministered because I always love this story about Hannah. Samuel's mother in 1 first, in first Samuel 1. Samuel's mother was barren. She was a wife of a man who had another wife. In those days, those things were all right. Men, do not go into that. that those days, you're not living in those days. I'm going to say, Brother Glenn, I preach that. And the woman used to mock her because she was pregnant. She was, she was barren. 
And they went up to the feast annually, etc. And, and, and she couldn't eat. And, and her husband saying, well, I know you have no son, but am I better to you than, 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 than many sons? And, but Hannah wanted a child. I'm coming to the ways of God. And she went now and she prayed before God and cried before God to the extent that the man of God, Eli the priest, tell her, put away your drinking. You, you get along drunk over that. He said, no, my Lord, my heart is heavy. And in the heaviness of my heart, I cry out before God. And she got a son. She made a vow to the Lord. That, Lord, you give me a son, I will give him back to you. She got a son. That son was Samuel, one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. She gave the son back to the Lord. What is the message to be gleaned here? Look at the ways of the Lord. And we sing it in song. He hears the cry of the brokenhearted. Many times our needs, we come before God and we articulate in them kind of half-hearted, you know. We articulate in them like, like um, a nice diplomatic prayer that we read. You know, you know, we articulate, well, Lord, bless all the hungry children in the world. And Lord, bless all those who have nothing to eat, Lord. And see, Lord, at the vagrants, Lord. And, 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 you, and you, you get in order, do you care for all them vagrants? And, you, and your line of prayer, Lord, is at the end. Lord, help me to get an increase in salary. Which is what you really wanted. No. <laughs> nothing is wrong with that. But there's always that deceit in the human heart, you know. We want to play, we pray, right, you know. Yeah? And we go, we pray for all the churches, Lord, that the gospel would be spread. And then, you know, we stick in our peace. No, nothing I'm saying is wrong. But there's a certain deceit in the heart. And you didn't go genuinely. You didn't go broken. You didn't, how, how, how sincere was the need? God hears the cry of the brokenhearted. The word of God said in Psalms that the Lord hears the cry of the righteous. And all those who call upon him in truth. The eyes of the Lord are upon those who fear him. And those who call upon him in truth. So we could be calling upon the Lord, but we are not sincere about it. But the ways of God are that he looks for the sincerity of heart. He looks for the sincerity of prayer. Now, what about the delay to our answers? Many times the delay comes to discern, for you to discern, or to sift the, your intent before God. How badly do you want it? How much do, do you really mean it? Hannah vowed before God. She said, Lord, if you give me this son, I will give him back to you. She made a vow. And God honored the vow. And so it was, and she kept her vow. She had many sons after. She had many children after. They were not mentioned in the word of, in the, word of the Lord. So although she gave her son, she did what she promised the Lord, but God did not forget her. In Psalm 50, I think it was verse 3 or 5, the Lord said, gather my people together. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. It's an interesting text. Gather my people. Who are my people? Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. We are God's people. Oh, our reasonable sacrifice is to present ourselves before him as a living sacrifice. And we are encouraged to offer prayers and thanksgivings unto God. Not so? Offer unto God the sacrifice of thanksgiving. That's in the word of God. Many times we don't feel like praising when they're singing. We feel like listening to them sing. And we miss out offering out our sacrifice. And what, but what does that do? What I want to focus on here is that you are now making a covenant with God when you sacrifice unto him. I would like to be in covenant with God. <laughs> you know why? He's the keeper of his covenant. Keep it. So understand the ways of God. That he will honor his, co his covenant. And if you go down to Psalm 116 and also you read Psalm 50, it will say, pay your vows down to God. Many times it may even be necessary for you to vow before God. 
Lord, I want it that bad. I will vow. But many times we don't reach that state, stage in our petition. We leave our petition maybe shallow. And God is waiting for us to get that need. You see, when our hearts are really broken and we start to cry, we start to labor in prayer, then we know of our sincerity before God. I don't have time to develop it because my time is all gone. I don't even have time to develop the, uh, the chapter. Somebody change that clock. <laughs> I don't have time. Because, because it's interesting what we learn here from this story with Asa, right? Asa distrusted God. When Basha came up against him, he distrusted God and he went to the king of Syria. Although he knew that God defended him against the Ethiopians and the Lubims. We have our experience with God. God has blessed us. He has saved us. He has preserved us. And we are into a little trouble. But we still will distrust God. And we will turn to other strategies and even keep ourselves away when that's the time to draw near to God. God sends something, sometimes a famine in our lives to draw us closer to him. And he holds up the answer so that my, you will come closer to him. Not to be wicked. But if we do not understand the ways of God, if we don't discern the ways of God, and what helps us to discern that is the sincerity of heart that we have towards God, that we know our petition is sincere. Not, well, I, I, I want that and they say to ask. So they say to ask. No, you, you are wanting the truth. They say to ask, so I ask him. We have to get past all of that to the point where you really, you really want it. And God brings us into sincerity because he desires truth in the inward part. So you and I are praying to God's sins and inside there, there is no truth. That is why he says forgive. That's why he says forgive. Because you come to me to forgive me for all your sins, but you want to choke the brother. And your, your, your hand, your Lord forgive you, but your hand on the brother choke your choke your hand. <laughs> That's how we pray. And so God, he, and no, Jesus Christ already tell you, you will not receive it. He will not forgive you yours if you don't forgive the brother. But we can't let go. So, all right, if, I'm not saying some issues are not difficult. But then, that's what we need to be seeking God after. Begging him, Lord, this hatred in my heart, help me get it away. Lord, yeah, before you ask for hamburger and chicken and chips and paint and all that for Christmas, deal with your heart so that your petition before God will be received. If we do not understand the ways of God, our petition is in vain. And as it is said in the book of James, we pray amiss. I really have to close now because I need to minister to your needs. We cannot go on with this message. We have to have a second part. So we will see where Asa went wrong. Interestingly, what Asa did, his, his distrust of God has caused him, has caused him to lose the opportunity to receive the kingdom of Syria and the kingdom of Israel. Let me explain it to you. Basha came against Asa. So Basha came to destroy Asa. Asa. And and, 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 and Asa went to the king of Syria. The king of Syria was a mighty king. That's why he went to him. But the king of Syria was also a heathen king. Had Asa stayed faithful to God, God would have delivered him from Basha and he would have given him Basha throne and the king of Syria throne. But all he ended up with, he ended up getting away from, 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 from Asa, from Basha. He ended up getting out of that trouble. And the prophet said to him in the same verse that we read, because you had done foolishly, from now on you will have wars. Many times when we distrust God or mistrust God and go to our own devices, we have no peace. Yeah. We, are, we get through, you know, we get through, but no peace, no, no contentment. The peace of God is not with us. Uh, the word of God says be anxious for nothing, but in all things with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God will keep your mind. It is the peace. One thing Satan can't give you is peace. One thing the devil cannot give you is that peace. When God comes in your situation, even if you do not see the answers yet, you have the peace of God. And you are able now to wait. 
Many times when we minister for you, or minister with you at the altar, God may, might, may, might only give you strength enough to continue to seek him yourself. The ways of God is such that he says, Lord, I will not share my glory with no man. We would like that. You see, boy, Brother Glenn, he more big, so he, he, I going for, he to pray for me. Listen, God is not listening to you, you know. Yeah, before you say, because of Brother Glenn, Brother Glenn, big mouth, he more spiritual. No. My voice is that big because my voice is big. I am not more spiritual or, or God will hear me more than another minister who would minister softly. I, my voice is big. I just sweat a lot. Nothing to do with holiness. <laughs> right? Because it's God we're talking about. So I don't want you, saints of God, and I'm sure this is not what's going to minister to you, for you to be dis- trying to look at a fella and discern whether or not he should pray for you. No. It's your faith in God. And because he says that all things should be done decently and in order, we have appointed Friday evenings to pray for your needs. So the call is going to be made as we are making it now. Do you have a need? Come to the altar. The altar is open. And let us pray with you. Let us take that need to God. Let us understand that God is faithful in all his ways. And many, many times, saints, God will lead you to tools. He would lead you to answers. He would give you strength in your situation to continue. The the, the grace of God that he would give you is probably even to see it end. Some situations, God may never, never, never change it. But he will so strengthen you as he said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And he still had the thorn in his flesh. The same thorn, the same messenger of Satan that is buffeting him that he thought he couldn't make. That, That is the same grace. That God gave him. And he made it. Where is the messenger of Satan? See, God has to prove himself that he's bigger than some of the problems in our lives. That they would come at you, but they can't take you out. Or if they take you out, it's because God wants them to take you out. Nothing can take you out. That's why Jesus Christ said, fear not those who can kill the body. And after that, they have nothing that they could do. Even that he's telling you, trust God in. So a fellow come and he'll kill you. But the only thing you could do is kill me. And listen, say like Jesus to, to, to Pilate. He said, you have no power over me except it given to you of heaven. Pilate, well, that whole chapter, I always marvel about it. Pilate gets stupid. Here is a fella telling me who have power to kill him. That if I kill him, God allow it. <laughs> Man, take away your power. And Jesus didn't set so for himself. We are the apple of his eyes. We are his people. We are his children. We are those that have made a covenant with him by sacrifice. We who would come with a prayer request here. You are the child of God. Yes, you are. God loves you. God, he cares about you. And he wants you to know him. He hears your cry. Stand to your feet as you pray. And if you have a need, be it for healing, whatever it is, Come and let us minister to you tonight. Don't wait until they finish singing the song. I, I, I preached a little more than I had to preach. Just come. Stop coming as though we're tired. Come, listen, don't, don't worry with people, you know. Don't worry what nobody say. No, the God is, is going to be testing your faith. It is your faith and your belief in God and his word. And all we are doing is we are undergirthing you with prayer and strengthening you. And continuing to join with you that God will give you the desires of your heart. As we sing the song.
Ready, we laid hands on many and word, a word the altar and prayed individually. Tonight, we will not do that. Tonight, I will pray corporately for everyone who's standing at the altar. You at the altar, I want you to bow your head, close your eyes, don't look at me. I can't answer prayer. It's your faith that has brought you here and you have responded because you believe not only that God is able, you believe that he will hear you. And more importantly, you want God to hear you. So you don't want to focus on man who preach, how we pray. Oh, no, you don't want to focus on that. This, right now, this moment is too precious. Right now, this moment is too important. I don't care. I am standing before God. Yes, I am following the general destruction, uh, instructions of the preacher. And your instruction right now is just to have your need on your heart. Bow in faith. Simple, simple faith. And receive the answer to your prayer from God. Father, we thank you for your rich and wonderful word. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and kindness towards us. And Lord, the time allotted tonight was not sufficient for us to really go into the fullness of your ways and how you will deal with your people. Lord, as many as are in this service this day, so we are different one from the, one from the other. Yes, Lord, we are all your children. We are all born of your spirit. We are all called unto you. But as you said, O oh Lord, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that like as the children of Israel, they all came out of Egypt. They were all baptized in the sea and were all under Moses. With all of them, God was not well pleased. For many died of unbelief. So Lord, we all have needs. I do not know the hearts of your people here, Lord, but you know, your, you know their heart. You know the point at which, oh God, their cry will come up to you sincere. You know the point, Holy Father, at which, Lord, they will understand the things that you are asking them to lay off. You know the point at which, Holy Father, you are going to intercede. You have already done the answer. Lord, we, we, we believe that and we know this, Lord, because Daniel prayed to you. And it took a whole 21 days after you dispatched one of the most powerful, powerful archangels with the answer. And the archangel had to explain to Daniel that from the time you set your heart to pray, the Lord heard you and I was dispatched with the answer. So Father, we lift up every head that is bowed down here before you. Every need, oh God. And whatever that need is, you care about your people. You care about your Israel. You care about us whom you have redeemed from sin and purchased by your blood. And so, Father, you care about the things that concern us. You said, Lord Jesus, that we are of more value than the sparrow. And so we speak your word, O oh Lord, in praying to you so that our hearts, Lord, are emboldened more to realize your love towards us. And so, Father, giving you all honor, giving you all glory, giving you all praise, realizing that you are holy God, a thrice holy God, realizing that you are faithful and true, O oh God, realizing, O oh God, you have called us to come boldly before the throne of grace, to receive help in time of need. We, O oh God, raise the hands of your people here before you. You know the need of every heart. No man, Lord, is laying hands on anyone or anyone is praying individually so that they would say that, that person has anything to do, Lord. It is our needs before you that we by faith lift up before you the situation of trouble, the difficulty in the relationship, the problem in our health, oh God, the difficulty in our finances, whatever the problem is, oh God, the difficulty in our job, spiritual problems, business problems, we lay them all before you. We have come before you, Lord. And we ask, oh God, that you would meet them, Lord, at the point of their need. Each member standing before you, each child of God here standing before you. Oh God, I pray, Father, that where 
where you, your spirit has already shown and continue to show us the things that we need to put in order. Even now I ask for Lord the strength, Father, the clarity, the understanding that we would attend to these things, Father, for in your goodness you have so ordained what you have ordained. We do not know all of your ways, Father, and we thank you for it because your ways are past finding out. But we thank you for what you have revealed for us, Lord. And you say, Lord, to call upon me, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will hear you, and I will show you great and marvelous things. Lord, it is on our record, and heaven records it that this day we call upon you. Let us lift our hands before God. We call upon you, Lord, concerning this situation. We call upon you, Lord, continue concerning this problem. We call upon you for your deliverance. We call upon you for your provision. We call upon you for your protection. We call upon you for your intervention. We call upon you for your strength. We call upon you for help, Lord. Help everyone, Lord. Hear our prayer. Hear the cry that we make before you this night. And so we thank you, Father. We thank you that you are able and we know that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above what we can ask or think. We think one thing, oh God, you are above that. And so far, since you have told us that your way is not our way, we trust you, Lord, to work it out according to your purpose. We ask you, oh God, to let your plans for us prevail. We yield in surrender to whatever you want us to do. If you want us to go through the problem for two more days, we will go through for two more days. You want us to go through for two more weeks, we will go through for two more weeks. You want us, oh, whatever you want, Lord, we yield now, Lord, to your Lordship, for this problem is in your hand. And we thank you for taking care of it, oh God. And now, Father, let your peace let your peace that passes all knowledge, all understanding, Lord, permeate the minds of each one of the altar here tonight. Touch them, cover them by the blood of Jesus. Let the joy of the Lord be in their heart. Let the confidence that they have brought their petition before you cause them to take a joy. No more bow down faces. No more wondering when it will happen. No, no, no. We know it is in your hands and it will happen, Lord, in your perfect time for you make all things beautiful in your time. So we are not going to be walking around, Lord. We are taking this decision in prayer. That we are not going to be walking around wondering when the answer will come. For we know that it will come in a perfect time. We know, we trust you, oh God. So our attitude is going to be different. Our joy is going to be filled. Because we trust you. Because we committed to you, Lord. And because you are faithful. We bless you. We praise you. We exalt you and magnify you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And the saints of God say, Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Yes. We sang the song, He knows your name. He knows your name. Child of God, you've just prayed before Him. But He knows your name. I don't know your name. If I came before you, I would have to ask, What's your name? But God knows. And I may mispronounce it to him, but God knows. He knows your name. And that is not so to say because he is God and he knows everything. No, no, no. God knows everything that concerns you. So I exhort you in confidence to be joyful. Let your faith, which is the evidence of things not seen, let your faith bring that joy in your heart. So am I going to see some smiles as we go back to, the, uh, to our seats? Amen? I want to see some smiles. Not me. You ask it of God. Hallelujah. Very gentle. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Hallelujah. He knows my name. Man, I must talk to the pastor about that clock. I just had to preach. I, I, I ain't break no sweat yet. It's, 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 it's time for us to go. But before we leave, if you're here tonight, you came to church tonight. You do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know about Jesus. You know that he's preached. You know they say he's the Son of God. But you have not received Jesus Christ as the gift of salvation that God gave to you. 
so that you will be justified in God's sight. You have not accepted him as your Lord. In other words, if you should leave this earth today, you are going to a lost eternity. You are not confident that you will stand righteous in the sight of God. Your name is not written in his book. You want to receive Jesus Christ tonight and to make him the Lord of your life? Before I close the service, I would like to give you that opportunity. If you will indicate by the raise of your hand, I will lead you in a prayer that will make the difference between hell and heaven, between a lost eternity and eternal life forever with Jesus Christ. Do you want to receive Jesus tonight when you're here? Would you like me to pray for you? Just slip your hand up and say, Preacher, pray for me. I would like to receive Jesus Christ tonight. Yes, sir, I see your hand. Is there someone else that is going to join with that gentleman and say tonight, Lord, I want to make you Lord of my life? People, it is a fact that we lived in difficult times. None of us know when we will leave this earth. None of, those, none, of not, none of us know when the end of our life will be. The word of God says it's appointed unto man wants to die. After that is judgment. After you have left this life, you cannot make it right with God. You are dead and dead men know nothing. Are you going to receive Jesus tonight? Is there going to be another who will join with this gentleman? Quickly so we don't keep back the others. Would you receive Jesus tonight? Then if, sir, you are the only person, would you come please? I would lead you in a prayer that would make a difference in your life. This is a profound moment in your life. But it is a simple moment because God has made it simple. You need only to believe in your heart. For the word of God says that if you would believe in your heart, in your heart, you believe the Lord Jesus. But you confess with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For it is with the heart that a man believes unto righteousness. And it is with your mouth that confession is made unto salvation. You have come forward to receive the salvation of God. I would lead you in a prayer. I ask you to make it the prayer of your heart. Repeat the words after me, but be sincere about the words you are repeating. When you repeat them, understanding will come to you. And the miracle of salvation will take place in your life now on the authority of the word of God. So would you close your eyes, bow your head, and pray this prayer after me. Dear God in heaven, I come to you today a sinner. For your word says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I believe with all my heart that you, Lord Jesus, left heaven's glory and came to earth and died for me. I believe with all my heart that you paid the price for my sin. And that you rose from the dead. I now accept you as my Savior. And confess you as my Lord. Lord Jesus. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Put your Holy Spirit in me. And teach me to live for you. By faith. I receive you into my heart, Lord Jesus. And I thank you for saving me. Amen. I will pray to you now. Father, I thank you for this young man. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you have drawn him and he has heard your voice. And your word, O oh God, is true that if any man hear your voice and open, Lord, you will come in and sup with him. I pray, O oh God, even from this night, he will experience, Lord, the change in his heart. Lord, the things, Lord, of the, of the 
world and the things that Satan, Lord, have no wrong with, as he had all of us, Lord, will begin, oh God, to peel away as he focuses his eyes on you. I thank you that the scale of his, of his eyes, Lord, natural and spiritual, have fallen off, and his understanding is open up, oh God, because by now the fate of God is in him. I thank you for the faith and joy in him. I bless him, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. What I'd like you to understand is that you're a big man, you're just born again. You haven't been born again, so the babies are born again. So as a baby, it requires milk. So you require the sincere milk of God's will so that you will grow right. There's a gentleman standing behind you, he will make an appointment with you. The appointment is to take you into the word of God and explain to you what you have received so you will understand what faith is. There is no thunder, no lightning. It is just your faith in God and His grace upon your life that makes all the difference. That's the power of an almighty God and the power of His love. I welcome you in the kingdom of God. Make it good.